Welcome back to Pod Save the World. I'm Tommy Vitor. I'm Ben Rhodes. Ben, today is Election Day. Is uh, it? Is it really? Yeah, and obviously the big news is that Tom Cotton has decided not to run for president. <laughs> yeah. I mean, the, it's hard to say no to a, a groundswell of popular demand that you I run. Know, I mean, I know. Uh, he had a movement for change across this country that is brokenhearted. Now. Tens of people yeah. <laughs> were calling on Tom Cotton to run. Tens is more than Mike Pompeo has. Um, right, yeah. right, right. I saw him tweeting um, really solicitous things at Bibi Netanyahu. Yeah, yeah. Um, we can always count on that. Um, yeah. So it's a weird day. Uh, we we were recording at 1.45 on uh, Pacific Time on Tuesday. We don't have the results in yet, but we have all the anecdotal bad news that uh, money can buy, thanks to Twitter and John Ralston's blog and everybody else. So, you know, this episode will turn into a pumpkin to some extent, but I think the international issues will endure. Hopefully they will. The country will, too. They will. Uh, will they, the country will endure as someone who's been through uh, tough midterms uh, before. Uh uh, uh, like I, I can offer you that middle-aged perspective. I, I will also say, just getting ahead of uh, ourselves a bit, um, our interview today is with Tabata Amaral, who's a, an amazing legislator in Brazil, she's 28 years old, but she's just got elected her second term, and she's kind of a rock star, and um, she gave an answer on, on how to win elections that we all need to listen to tomorrow. All so, right. So just skip to that if you want some some hope uh, and some solutions. I yeah. like that. Yeah. I like that very much. Um, we are also going to cover uh, the ongoing debate about diplomacy with Russia over the war in Ukraine and what the midterms could mean for United States efforts to fund the war effort. I'll talk a little bit about some rare candor from a Russian oligarch. Disgraced former Israeli Prime Minister Bibi Netanyahu is sadly back. We kind of previewed this one last week. Yeah. Ben. He's no longer the former guy. <sighs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that got me. Uh, there was some awful uh, incident of uh, racism in Parliament in France. Uh, the climate change summit in Egypt is happening as we speak, and then some shorter updates. And then, Ben, I woke up this morning to the news that the disgraced former head of FIFA, the, the body that governs international soccer, said letting Qatar host this year's tournament uh, he said that it was a mistake, which, um, you know, solid uh, a decade late there. Some real some real cynical. Is that because he's been listening to World Corrupt? I, uh, that's what I'm yeah. wondering. Yeah. Uh, it's a podcast I'm doing with Roger Bennett. It's literally in your feed right now. It's very fun. Episodes are like 35 minutes. You'll enjoy it. Give it a shot. Also, I noticed as well that you have a big Taiwan piece out today. I do. Uh, I've got uh, a piece in the December issue of The Atlantic, actually in the magazine. They still print magazines. Um, Does that feel any different? Uh, I, it's nicer. Yeah, it's more substantial, right? Yeah. Like it's a, something to it's frame. A hard copy, right? And uh, but it basically, as as it, we can talk a little bit about this, but I, I I went to Taiwan. I interviewed President Tsai. I interviewed the Foreign Minister Joseph Wu. But but even or equally important, I should say, uh, a bunch of younger people, you know, the kind of people I think that, that you know, we've tried to have on this show, including Emily Wu, yeah, Ghost who we've Media, had right? on this show, yeah, from Ghost Island Media, um, to just get at this question of like, how did, what is going on in Taiwan? How did they build this very resilient democracy? And how are they dealing with this threat of potential invasion from China? How are they making themselves more resilient? Um, I didn't love the title they threw on my article, I'm just going to say, <laughs> which is Taiwan Prepares to be Invaded. It's weird you uh, don't get to choose that. You don't get to choose the title. And I, I remember when I used to call reporters and yell at them about some title, they'd always yeah, say, oh, my address is up. So uh, I didn't choose the title, guys. But actually, if you want a primer on just kind of what's going on there. But the most important piece of this, there, there are kind of two pieces that I was really interested in. One is, I don't think Americans know the story of Taiwan. Um, Basically, this is a country that was, you know, governed as an autocracy throughout the Cold War from a, a party that was founded to govern China, not mm -hmm. Taiwan. And Chiang Kai-shek, after losing the Chinese Civil War, came to Taiwan in 1949, governs under martial law for decades. You're not the best guy. Not, yeah, not, not killed tens of thousands of people. Um, and there's a great democratic success story in Taiwan that I think people need to know, which is that they overthrew an autocracy. They've had you know, different political parties govern. They've, under the current administration, legalized same-sex marriage. Mm -hmm. It's a progressive government there. Um, they're doing really innovative things to combat disinformation from China. I met some really interesting young people doing that. Um, so that's an important story because they kind of cut against the global trend on democracy backsliding. And, and it's part of why Taiwan matters so much because it, it is a thriving democracy. 
But then there is this question of how are they dealing with the threat of Chinese invasion? I asked President Tsai about some of these debates around what are they learning from the Ukraine war? And I will tell you that, Tommy, that when I went there, I was actually surprised at, at how profound an effect the war in Ukraine had on the oh, Taiwanese people. Yeah, it actually was more than I weighing thought. Heavily. It was weighing heavily. Every single person I talked to, you could tell, had been thinking about this yeah, and thinking I mean, like sense. They, they'd always known that there was this threat of a Chinese invasion or military intervention, but Ukraine made it really real for them. Mm-hmm. And it was interesting, not the military exercises after the Pelosi visit that we talked about in the show. Ukraine kind of weighed heavier because you know they're they're looking at real time at a big country invading a smaller neighbor yeah, yeah. to try to take it over. In the world's and, response. and so we go through the questions of how do they deal with that and do they shift their defense priorities, for instance, to buying the small arms that Ukraine has used to repel a larger invader, or will arming themselves like that provoke China? Mm-hmm. Um, how do they break out of their diplomatic isolation? without provoking China? Can they engage in any kind of diplomacy with China when China insists that the terms of that diplomacy are you have to accept that you're part of our country, right? And so, uh, you know, there's no right answer to these questions either. You know, like you're just trying to find this balance. Um, So I I hope people pick it up and and check it out. Definitely. I was listening to an interview with um, the U.S. ambassador to China, Nick Burns, recently. And that's obviously a big job in a normal year, but it's a particularly big job in the COVID era, when you literally can't get in and out of the country. Like, there's no yeah. visiting delegations. Xi Jinping is barely leaving, right? So, like, he's the guy. Yeah. And he said that it wasn't just the, like, shelling and, you know, the sort of uh, overt acting out, firing missiles and stuff after the Pelosi visit that really has been a problem. It's that the Chinese cut off all contact. Like, all, like, eight different channels of contact were just silence. And I don't know that they've come back. No, that's right. So there's a lot of things that, that again, I, I learned in writing this piece, you know, the, the Pelosi, the exercises they did around the Pelosi visit, for instance, mimicked a blockade. Yeah. And Taiwan imports all of its energy. And so they're suddenly having to think about, like, well, what happens if right. we're in that scenario and maybe they haven't invaded us, but, like, how do we maintain Just electricity, right? Them, yeah. How do we keep, you know, communications going if they're cut off? Like... Uh, what, how do people need to prepare in their homes? And I met young people, again, would be familiar to us, they're like human rights activists, who on the weekends are getting kind of training and emergency response, you know. Um, and so it's a very <laughs> unique uh, circumstance and and one that I think, you know, this is going to be a bigger and bigger question for America going forward. Yeah, because what agree. kind of arms are we providing them? What for kind sure. of diplomatic support? Biden, as we've talked about, has said he would come to their defense. Like, th- this is going to be a big issue in the next couple of years. Yeah, for sure. Uh, well, let's talk about Ukraine because yes. that continues to be a big issue. Yeah. So, you know, the military update is very similar. The Russians continue to target civilian infrastructure like we've talked about with these missile strikes to the point where the mayor of Kiev is warning that residents might need to survive the winter without electricity, water or heat. So like that's how dire things are getting yeah. in the biggest city in the capital city. Uh, Western countries, the U.S., Germany, for example, are sending uh, more and more advanced missile defense systems to try to prevent that shelling from happening. But obviously you can't undo the damage. And then the flip side is Russia is reportedly buying uh, even more advanced ballistic missiles from Iran or at least preparing to. So things are continuing to escalate. Um, then I think it was last week. It could have been 100 years ago. I don't remember at this point. We talked about the sort of strangely... <laughs> vicious controversy yeah, yeah. over this letter over from progressives letter, yeah. yeah, in the House pushing for more diplomacy. The good news on that front is that Jake Sullivan, Biden's national security advisor, has reportedly been holding talks with uh, a foreign policy advisor to Vladimir Putin. So that's good news. I, I don't know about you. I've also kind of always assumed or at least hoped that Bill Burns, CIA director, has a channel with his counterpart in Russia or someone in Russia. Like Bill was the U.S. ambassador to Moscow, yeah, I yeah. think, during the Bush administration. Yeah, he knows a lot about Russia. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, the other update on this is, do you see on, on yesterday, on, on Monday, uh, President Zelensky outlined his conditions for talks, which include uh, restoration of Ukraine's territorial integrity, compensation from Russia for material losses caused by the war, punishment of war criminals, and respect for the U.N. charter. Um, the territorial integrity bit basically means give us back everything you've taken since 2014. So Crimea. Yeah. Pretty maximalist. <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, but understandable. Um, but Ben, so, you know, obviously, as listeners know, Ukraine's military success has been enabled by U.S. arms shipments. Those could be in jeopardy if Republicans take control of Congress. Here's an example of why. 
Under Republicans, not another penny will go to Ukraine. <clears throat> Our country comes first. So that was Marjorie Taylor Greene again. Uh, I think then you know, there's often an assumption that with foreign policy, like the adults come together, they manage these issues in a bipartisan way. I, I don't know about that here. Like, I feel like she's kind of running the show with McCarthy more than you would like to think. Yeah, I think that we shouldn't underestimate uh, the potency of that message to the Republican base that doesn't really give a shit about you know people in other countries. Well, no. I, I don't want to – not everybody in the Republican base, but the, the Marjorie Taylor Greene p- part of the party at least. Well, and just you know, to add to your point, yeah. Wall Street Journal had a poll, like the percentage of Republicans polled who said that the U.S. is doing too much for Ukraine went from 6 percent in March to 48 percent this month. Yeah. And so this will be a building thing. Um, and you already saw McCarthy, who, who doesn't really have any views of his own. He responds to what's happening in his own party. You know, he's the one who went out and said, we, you know, uh, we scrutinize funding more. Um, what does this mean in practice? Um, I think, first of all, I, I mentioned this on a previous podcast, but like I would be trying to get funding in that lame duck session, assuming the Democrats lose the House. But also, like, I, I would be th- – thus far, for instance, there's not a mechanism to review that funding. Um, like, a, there's a special inspector general right, for yeah. um, funding to Iraq and Afghanistan. I think there should be, right? Yeah. Because one way that you kind of take the air out of the balloon of, of people who are critics is to say, no, look, we will scrutinize this funding, make sure there's no waste. And uh, so I think Democrats should get ahead of this a little bit um, as someone who supports continued funding to Ukraine – um, to show that you know we're we're you know we're being careful with taxpayer money, um, so that's that's one set of issues here. I think the diplomacy piece to this that, that came out first of all did kind of make the brouhaha over that letter seem kind of even stranger. Yeah, um, because very dumb. What, what what was that all about, guys? I don't know. Progressives, I come don't on. Get it. I, don't um, get it. I don't know why we have to have a circular firing squad over here when we've got Marjorie Taylor Greene over here, right? Um, but to the 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 story that came out about Jake Sullivan. A couple thoughts on that. Um, one is it's interesting that Jake Sullivan, as national security advisor, is the one engaged in this diplomacy. And one of the people they reported him as meeting with was Patrushev, who, who's kind of kind of his counterpart in the Russian system and a very powerful person. Uh, it, that's not unusual to me. The, sometimes the, the Russians like to deal directly with the White House. You know, they, they, they you know power center to power center. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like this is you know the Kremlin is not a place that that has a, an interagency process, if you will. Right. right. It was run, run by the Kremlin. So I think it makes sense that there's a White House line in. As much as I also think that um, it'd be great if Bill Burns has con- contacts, um, uh, Tony Blinken obviously if he can as well, um, because you just want to keep these lines open again, not to negotiate about. Ukrainian territory over their heads, but there's a lot to talk about. There's yeah. nu- nuclear de-escalation, you know, de-escalation on the nuclear issue. There's kind of emergency hotline contingency planning you want to set up. There's the grain, the food shortage we, we, we want to get unstuck. There's a lot of issues that we have to cover. And then on the negotiations themselves and Zelensky's positions, look, I mean, if you're Zelensky, you're going to start with really maximum. Of course. Positions. I don't think anybody... Not going to concede something now. Like, yeah. what, what would that even be? And not just territory. Like you know, like you want to. I don't think Russia is going to pay reparations for everything. But either. like, hey, start there sure. because you know you're going to need some ground to give up in a negotiation, right? So take the most maximalist position here. But people just have to remember, even in the event of a Ukrainian victory, right? Like, let's say they do run the table and they take back all this territory. Nobody thinks. They're marching all the way to Moscow and and ousting the government and you know like at the end of World War II. No, there is going to be a Russia next to Ukraine, forever, right? And there's going to be a Putin, or if Putin goes, it's probably not going to immediately be like Alexei Navalny running a multi-party no, democracy. So, either, yeah. so there's going to have to be a negotiation here, um, and, and we shouldn't be fighting with each other about that. That makes no sense. We should just be thinking about the smartest way to do it. Yeah, it'll probably be an angry Putin for a little while. Um, the the other remarkable story that kind of went under the radar was a, a Russian oligarch who we've talked about before, uh, Yevgeny Prigozhin, said on Monday that Russia 
had in fact interfered in the U.S. elections uh, and would do so again. Yeah. <laughs> he fittingly disclosed this on the Russian version of Facebook, saying, uh, quote, we have interfered in U.S. elections. We are interfering and we will continue to interfere carefully, accurately, surgically, and in our own way as we know how to do, end quote. So this is a guy who ran all the bot farms you heard about in 2016. He also runs the Wagner Group, yeah. the mercenaries for hire who are fighting in Ukraine. And again, with the Wagner Group, for years, Pergozin would deny that its existence. He would sue journalists that reported on his connections to the Wagner Group. Now he's talking about it publicly. He's literally like going to prisons, and there's videos of him recruiting prisoners to try to join his little militia. So uh, I don't know what led to this candor, Ben. I'm not sure if he got some therapy or something, but um, tough week for everybody that denied that Russian interference ever happened in, in 2016. Well, that's, yeah. I mean, like, this isn't just like some random guy saying this. This is the guy. This is the guy who would have run it, who right? Owned the, it. The Wagner Group did the influence operations, well, they were part of it at least, um, and, and certainly the troll farms. So this is Pergozin owning it, uh, coming out and saying it. And look, this was always the case that there was a connection between the war in Ukraine and their intervention in domestic politics. That was my experience at the end of the Obama administration. One, once that war started in 2014, 2015, that's when they started dialing up their disinformation campaigns, not just in the U.S., but in Europe. I think they see Ukraine as like a domestic Russian issue. And yeah. when, you know, we, we don't see it that way, but that's no. how they see it, because they truly believe Putin and Gazak Pergozin that this should be part of Russia. And so when we start providing training to the Ukrainians and sanctioning them over Ukraine, they think, OK, you're in our domestic politics now. We're coming into yours. There was an, a really good, long, very long article in the Sunday Times magazine. Did you see this by Jim what, Rudenberg? You know, um, I read part of it. I mean, the bottom line is I it, couldn't get my brain back to the it, well, but this Mueller is the, probe, you know. The Mueller thing was really damaging in a way, how that played out, because Trump was so successful in kind of creating this illusion that the Russia thing was a hoax and it was, or was, at least it was overhyped. No, th this all happened. No, <laughs> they no, interfered know, in know. our election. They had contacts with Trump. There's no doubt. Paul Manafort was basically like a, a Russian asset, you know, and, yep. and, and, and we just kind of swept that under the rug because. It wasn't Mueller time, and the, the where the Krasenstein brothers didn't get to see. You know, <laughs> there was no, yeah, there was no uh, indictment. Or yeah, there was no indictment. Anything, yeah. That didn't mean that th this shit didn't happen, and it doesn't mean that the Russians aren't continuing to interfere in our politics. It's just so we have to 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 you know the the debate got so dumbed down on it. All those people that like to sit in the cheap sheets and and take shots at people for talking about RussiaGate, you're you're wrong. You're wrong. The guy, who, the guy who did it just admitted it, right? And, well, and what's so frustrating is, remember, you know, the infamous, uh, where was the summit with Trump and Putin? In Helsinki. The Helsinki yeah. summit, right? When Putin, Trump was like, oh, he told me he didn't do it. I believe him. Like, that should be humiliating, disqualifying, end of story. But, like, we live in this upside down political world that it, no one will seem to notice. And the bottom line is, look, we know, for instance, at that summit that, you know, Trump was meeting with Putin alone without a translator at times. And it's not beyond the realm of possibility that what they were talking about was NATO and Ukraine and Putin at least making his case for why you should pull out of yeah. NATO or why you should not Seems care about likely. Ukraine. There is a connection here between these things. It's not a conspiracy theory like Putin. That's what he wanted. He wanted the U.S. out of NATO and he wanted the U.S. to basically cut off the Ukrainians yeah. and, and, you know, like, let me turn this into a vassal state. And, and so there's a there's a very direct connection between the, the vein of the Republican Party that Marjorie Taylor Greene gave word to, that Tucker Carlson represents every night, that is kind of either Putin adjacent, if not outwardly pro-Putin, uh, and what Putin's trying to do here. It, you know, or at least uh, isolationist, right, too. Yeah. And I think like any support for Ukraine that, has become yeah. a proxy for like somehow being anti-Trump because of impeachment. It's like the dumbest thing on the planet. And that's the thing that people always need to understand is that... It, Donald Trump didn't need to be a Manchurian candidate serving Vladimir Putin. If he was an isolationist right. who just didn't give a shit about Europe, that served Putin's interest enough. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. Um, speaking of governments that like to interfere in our politics, Ben, Bibi Netanyahu, Ugh. he's back. So he still has to form a governing coalition. But in the recent election, the Likud party won 32 seats straight up. And then Bibi's broader coalition won 64 seats which is more than enough to form a government. So he should be able to do this. Uh, Netanyahu clawed his way back into power despite multiple corruption scandals, an, an actual corruption trial that's ongoing. Uh, and he did so by forging coalitions with some genuinely scary far-right extremists. We talked briefly last week about uh, Itamar Ben-Gavir, a lawmaker. He's been called the David Duke of Israel. 
pulled a gun on a Palestinian protester, urged security forces to shoot them. This was very recently. Uh, he wanted to deport critics, uh, Arab critics in particular. He had a photo on his wall of a man who massacred uh, 29 Palestinians in a terrorist attack. That detail jumped out to me, It's by the way. shocking. Yeah. It's shocking. And I had you, a poster of, like, John Starks on my wall. Right, yeah. yeah. <laughs> How about like a musician? Uh, and, and yeah, he was also been so extreme that they wouldn't let him in the military. But now this guy, Ben Gvir, is likely to be named the Minister of Internal Security. And like that's just one example of this coalition now. So the election itself, there were some rule changes that helped lead to this outcome. But it was also just the abject failure of the anti-Netanyahu side to join forces and work together in the face of like a fascist. And so now the U.S. has to figure out how to deal with this new government. And I, I don't know about you, but I'm not thrilled about the idea of sending a bunch of taxpayer dollars to a corrupt racist Neither prime minister Neither or a homeland security secretary who literally supports terrorists and photos of them on, on his wall. Yeah. No, I mean, I, I, and it's not going to go down easy when you hear the inevitable talking points about how we're there's no daylight between us and Israel on anything. And, you know, w- when we're talking about a government that has this guy in charge of the police, yeah. you know, I mean, this is a problem. And and over the next couple of years, if you think that there's not going to be flare ups in the West Bank or in Gaza and and really potential brutal human rights violations, th- that's their plan like that's oh, yeah. their They're policy like, they, they, this guy is you know they're it's a pro annexation government um it, it's a government that th- literally this guy has argued for immunity for idf and israeli police who fire on palestinians mm-hmm. right so this is going to come up what you know people want it to go away they they want to avoid the problem they they don't want to get involved in the israeli palestinian issue again but we don't necessarily get to choose so the first thing is we should be prepared for real issues in Jerusalem and the West Bank, and never mind Gaza. But also, this is where I get like the, the PTSD, Tommy. As Me we're, too. We're thinking about a potential Republican House and maybe Senate and Bibi Netanyahu. All yeah. those things are coming back at the same time, right? And so you could also have a Netanyahu in the run-up to a 2024 election, once again, putting his thumb on the scale, trying to get involved in U.S. politics, trying to support Republicans. And as you said last time, if the Democratic plan is to throw your arms around Bibi and say, oh, it was Obama's fault that he didn't get along with Bibi. We know how to deal with this guy. We No, that you have not learned anything about the, who Bibi Netanyahu is. It was not Barack Obama's fault yeah. that Bibi Netanyahu is basically a Republican. We, we talked about this. There was a story in The New York Times, I think, probably triggered both of us about like contrasting the Biden Netanyahu and Obama Netanyahu relationship. And what drives me crazy about these analysis pieces is they still kind of like treat Netanyahu like some neutral arbiter who was doing his best or was honest along <laughs> yeah. the way. Like, no, he wants Trump back. Yeah. Spare me this bullshit about how like Bibi could trust Biden's heart is in the right place or for Israel. Like, no, he's a corrupt right wing jackass who loves Donald Trump. He was never committed to a peace process. He wants to annex the West Bank. He wants the U.S. to bomb Iran on his behalf. And he wants to not get told what to do while receiving billions in military aid. And like, if you don't pause to at least just like think through the policy again, when a guy like Ben Gavir becomes a Homeland Security Secretary, when do you? I don't get it. Is there anything that could lead to a reassessment of things like conditioning military assistance? Like if they start to annex the West Bank, you know, do, do you even think about that? Is there anything anything that, that, that this government could do that would draw a rebuke, a real rebuke from the United States. And, and to your point about the media, like they cover BB like they cover the Republicans as if as if the last decade hasn't happened. You know, um, exactly. This is somebody who has not been pushed to the right by, you know, Barack Obama being impolite to him once or something. It, this is just who he is. This like, is politics. This is his politics. He's not even a religious guy. He just like wants power. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and 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 he's got a right wing worldview, and therefore he's willing to jump into bed with people like this, and and so I, I just think this is something, you know, as with the domestic politics here, like this is going to be a bumpy road the next couple of years. Real bumpy. Uh, okay, real quick warning here. The next this next story is awful. So we've talked about um, right wing parties are real. Th- th- uh, theme today, Ben. Uh, we talked about France before. Usually it's Marine Le Pen, who is um, 
her heinous. But today we're talking about a member of her political party. Here's the backstory. So a 31-year-old black lawmaker named uh, Carlos Martins Bilongo was addressing the French National Assembly about migrants stranded at sea. During his speech, a far-right French lawmaker named Gregoire de Fournas from Marine Le Pen's National Rally Party literally shouted, go back to Africa. Uh, de Fournas, the guy who shouted, later said he was talking about sending migrant boats back to Africa, not directing this comment at his black colleague. He apparently thought that made it sound better. I do not. Uh, regardless, like this guy was booed. The the assembly session was suspended. De Fournas, uh, de Fournas himself was suspended from parliament for 15 working days. Marine Le Pen, of course, defended him. Um, you know, Macron's party, El Marche, the more moderate party in charge, condemned the racism. But like my fear, Ben, is all the things we're talking about today. We'll get to climate change in a minute. Um, these far right voices are clearly emboldened in a lot of places. And as we've seen in the U.S. and as we've seen in this story in France, immigration becomes the vehicle for vocalizing what is, at essence, just pure racism. You know, and I think like when people see people like this shout stuff or or just like go public with their racism like that, it tends to build on itself. And it just makes me very nervous. Yeah. Well, also, like, as you said, I, you know, because I was really, you know, this caught my attention too. you know, Marine Le Pen totally backed this guy up. Totally you backed know? Him up. And, and she probably thinks it's a political winner. Right. For this guy to be seen as being victimized and you know suspended. Um and that speaks to the kind of grotesque <laughs> emergence of of this far right over the years in France and other places in Europe. But it's not going away, you know, and, and we have to figure out ways to deal with it. And I think what's really challenging and and Tabata kind of gets it. So you'll you hear in the interview, she talks about the evangelicals who are Bolsonaro's base. Mm -hmm. And the, the part of what we did in this, she said, in the second round uh, where Lula won is like, we tried to start a dialogue with these people, right? I'm not saying you should start a dialogue with this racist asshole, but you need to figure out a way to start a dialogue with some of those voters. You know, um, at some point, there has to be a way to reach people who are turning in this direction by communicating to them why that's not the political answer to their fucking grievances. And it's not appealing um, <laughs> when it's under the cover of such overt racism from people like this. I totally get that. This guy should have been condemned. He should have been suspended one million percent. What he did is grotesque. By the way, it flies in the face of how the French like to talk about themselves, because telling a, a, a black French lawmaker to go back to Africa in France, it's supposed to be colorblind. Everybody's right. French. Yeah. Right. Um, but like you have to find ways to crack the facade uh, that is being built around these voters who are turning in this direction and, and, and have conversations with these people. Yeah, and also, I mean, I don't know, look, maybe there's a, a good outcome from this, which is that Marine Le Pen and her party, they've been trying to do with a lot of these far right wingers do what Ben Gavir did in Israel, which is like shave off the edges, yeah, yeah. renounce some of the most abhorrent former views, try to pass as just, you know, a lesser, less racist or less overtly racist version of whatever they used to be. Maybe this, you know, gets the scales off everybody's eyes and sees these people who they really are and always have been. Yeah, it, it, you should like totally call it out. This is who they are. You should be making that moral argument. And then you should also be, to be more specific about what I was getting at, I'm not just saying like, oh, let's go and go to a diner in, no, in Southern not. France. You know, no, no, no. I guess that's a bistro there. Sure. But the point is the some of the voters that they're winning, like immigration is being blamed for everything when that's not the problem, like some of the, the economic problems, you know, like are, are not because there's like some boat crossing the Mediterranean here. No. Um, and, and, you know, you got to get out there and do the work of winning back enough of those voters so that these creeps aren't creeping into power like they have been. Yeah. I mean, but look, you know, another happening now and coming soon driver of migration is climate yes. change. Yeah. So, you know, biggest story in the world this week, biggest story every week is still climate change. The COP27 uh, UN climate summit is happening as we speak. Where else but in Egypt? The perfect place. Because of uh, the dictator Sisi's deep and abiding desire yeah. to fight climate change. He cares deeply. Yeah. Uh, apparently there's a shortage of food and water. And uh, the many of the 40,000 delegates are comparing it to the fire Festival. It's not the important part, obviously. Uh, but a draft report uh, that came out of the U.S. government associated with the with the summit 
called the uh, National Climate Assessment paints a very dire picture for us in the U.S. The U.S. has warmed 68% faster than the Earth as a whole. We obviously passed this big aggressive climate bill earlier in the year, but still aren't on track to get to net zero by 2050. Uh, and despite the outsized contribution the U.S. has made to global warming itself, the U.S. was not among the group of developed nations that offered direct aid to help uh, fix losses and damage from climate change for developing countries. So the Europeans were leading the charge there. Obviously, that kind of commitment would be demagogued to death yeah. by Republicans yeah. here, by Marine Le Pen over there. But Ben, anything like jump out of you at this summit? I saw that John Kerry is trying to work on a plan to allow developing countries to earn climate credits by reducing emissions, sell them to businesses, use that to fund renewables. Not totally sure how it works, but it seems like he's getting creative. The thing that jumped out to me in the early days of this summit, which is obviously ongoing, was at every one of these cops, um, the, the decibel level of developing countries and island nations demanding more support for climate mitigation mm -hmm. grows. Like, yeah. I was in Glasgow and I, I did a, uh, I was in a session with the island nations and they're like, we it's happening now. Like I mean, part of the problem is in the past, it's like someday in the future, there could be these climate effects. And these island nations are like, uh, our coastlines are disappearing. Yeah. We need to move our people. Yeah. Uh, that costs a lot of money. We don't have a lot of money. You rich guys created this problem. You need to help us now. And I think the headlines so, to me thus far is John Kerry absolutely has been tenacious in trying to take on issues like methane and how do you reduce you know reduce deforestation, getting at the core emissions issues, where there is some progress being made and the U.S. kicking in a huge amount of money in the Inflation Reduction Act mm -hmm. uh, is going to help. But <laughs> I love how you always <laughs> choke on the name of that. <laughs> let's just be honest. It's, what else it's the midterms. Like, we be honest. Like, yeah. what, it wasn't really about that, was it? Uh, no, I mean, no, uh, but anyway. No, Joe Manchin um, being a genius. Yeah, genius to stop that name on. But you're right. It's going to be hard to get government assistance for this. But I think the U.S. government, and Kerry's talked about this, is going to have to get a little more creative in marshalling funding for mitigation. You just talked about migration, too. There's going to be enormous needs to prevent if, if you don't want hundreds and hundreds of millions of climate refugees right. coming into the U.S. and Europe, destabilizing our politics even more. Like, you better raise a lot of money and get it out fast. And it, the U.S. has to, therefore, be working with philanthropy. The government can work with philanthropies, with businesses, with the financial sector to marshal resources. The, U the U.S. government can do that, even if we can't get a Republican co Congress to pass a lot of money to provide to developing countries to mitigate climate. There are other innovative things that can be done. We need to be rushing funds out the door to mitigate the effects of climate change or else they're going to hit us oh, yeah. in areas like migration. The challenge with every issue like this is that the Democratic Party is always on the side of the correct, in my opinion, but long term solution to the problem. Yeah. Whereas the Republican side is like push the boats back into the water or drill for oil, drill for more oil back. or yeah. more yeah. police, yeah. not to fund. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's yeah. like you yeah. can't. Like it takes a long time to rethink policing, climate change, mitigation, et cetera. And it's just going to be brutally hard. But I agree with you. I mean, I do think like, you know, some like a slightly jingoistic sounding message. Maybe that will move people. I, I don't know what to do, but it's going to take some real work here. It's going to take real work. I mean, and just Tabata in the interview, too, like we talked about the Amazon and she was saying something I didn't fully realize, which is in addition to Bolsonaro just kind of gutting these policies uh, to prevent deforestation. It's incredibly violent there now. Oh, right? God, yeah, the, yeah. Like, and, and so part of... The journalist who got murdered Yeah, recently, like, in yeah. order to fight deforestation, you need to somehow, like, fight these, like, violent traffickers and gangs that are, like, doing the logging. It just shows you how complex this issue is. But I think it's going to take solutions where, to reduce emissions, you have, like, replicable, you know, things, like clean energy that can be scaled up fast. And again, like other ways to get funding from outside of government to deal with this mitigation. For sure. The other thing this is highlighting, the fact that the cop is in Egypt, is their human rights record, yeah. how bad it is. Uh, specifically, there's a political prisoner named Ala Abd uh, El Fatah who's been on a 200-day hunger strike. He's vowed to stop drinking water when the summit starts. He's a dual Egyptian-British citizen. And like people are obviously like lobbying the Rishi Sunak, the new prime minister of the UK, to help get him out. And man, I saw a video this morning of Rishi Sunak just like bolting 
through some auditorium with a journalist trying to ask him for comment on the case and just refusing to fucking acknowledge the guy's existence. Like the most pathetic thing I've ever seen. Are you, are you shocked that the, the hedge fund guy that yeah. runs the UK? I Deer mean, in headlights. I, look, he, they, this is a country with tens of thousands of political prisoners. Uh, I, I just hope that the Biden administration uses all of these senior people going over there to press them on individual cases like this one and the bigger question of why they have like a brutal dictatorship that receives again billions of dollars in aid from the u.s israel and egypt the two biggest recipients of Mm -hmm. of u.s assistance have featured in this podcast so they should be pressing this issue i think as much as i support everybody being part of climate solution right so egypt is gonna have to be part of the climate solution there's something kind of cynical about like this cop is in Egypt, the next one's in the UAE, the, which, you know, o, you know, like OPEC country. That yeah. you know, like what are we doing? They're they're kind of hacking the the kind of global goodwill around climate summits to 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 to, to launder their reputations, um, and and that's a bit un, un, unappetizing as well. Yeah, so, I mean, like Qatar is trying to say that they're buying uh, carbon offsets to make the World Cup green. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> sure. Yeah. Sure. You are. Yeah. It's like you know, you you get the private jet ride and you like buy the carbon offset. Yeah. Yeah. A yeah. decade of infrastructure build out from an oil and like a petro state. Yeah. I'm yeah. Sure. It'll be a carbon neutral. Yeah. We should say, by the way, just put a pin in it uh, after we recover from our midterm hangovers. Biden's got some big summits coming up. He leaves uh, Thursday, right? Yeah. Yeah. Because we got COP and we've got, but also, you know, he's going to be with. G and Putin at the G20. Yeah. So uh, there's going to be a hot pod save the world next week. Man, that yeah. will be, that's some high stakes stuff. Yeah. It's hard to, I mean, listen, we got our asses kicked in the midterm and then we went overseas and accomplished a whole bunch of stuff in the lame duck. So like you can, yeah. you can sprint out of an ass kicking in a midterm. It just takes a little work. Like we did the new start treaty, got a bunch of things done. Don't ask, don't tell. Don't ask, don't, don't tell. Don't ask, don't tell repeal. Yeah. Chorus. Cor- oh, yeah. who could forget chorus? Yeah, yeah, the U.S. But, Korea free trade agreement. Yeah, yeah, who can forget that? I also one. got my ass chewed out by a really grumpy Barack Obama on that trip because the press coverage was so bad because all the press was like, Obama chastened, reduced, d- diminished by. Uh, I mean, this is the famous thing, uh, famous among about five of us. <laughs> <laughs> where he, he chewed us all out at the G20 press conference prep. Uh, yeah. Because he was getting bad headlines, and it's like me and Saki and Gibbs, and you're there. It's and like, it's like uh, sorry, uh, if you get your ass kicked in the midterms, that's kind of what happens. It's like, why does this yeah. story say Obama fails to get a uh, free trade agreement completed? It's like, well, we failed to get the free trade agreement completed. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and we did just get our ass kicked yeah, in the midterms. Yeah, we got smoked. So, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay, a couple more short updates uh, before we get to Ben's interview. So, uh, former Pakistani Prime Minister Imran Khan was shot in the leg at a rally last week. Cool. He yeah. survived. <laughs> yeah. uh, Pakistan politics is fucking like, I mean, wild he, right now. Yeah. He said they removed three bullets from his leg. Yeah, yeah. And it was super murky, right? Because, you know, he obviously said that the government did this. The guy said he did it because for religious reasons, but it, it was just the whole thing looked... You know, they're just very unstable there. Very. And Imran Khan's popularity is proving to be very durable. Yes, yes, yeah. it is. Um, protests in Iran are still uh, ongoing, if not picking up. Uh, and President Biden raised a couple eyebrows <laughs> when he said last week, quote, don't worry, we're going to free Iran. They're going to free themselves pretty soon. Uh, this was during a campaign speech. I think he was in San Diego. He was out here in California, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah. Uh, but, you know, some complicated history there of the U.S., toppling uh governments in iran so uh that that you know or raise and also eyebrows. just like raising expectations so, yeah. you know like yeah. uh, we all want to see uh, a free iran we all would love to see like a you know multi-party elections and respect for women's rights across the board but the capacity of the u.s to impose that you know is is quite limited yeah i think he was probably just showing solidarity with yeah. protesters yeah. because i don't know if you noticed this ben i mean there is a, a vibrant Iranian and Armenian community in Los Angeles in particular. Oh, yeah, yeah, you yeah, see yeah, a lot yeah, of yeah, protesters, yeah. like, you know, people in the streets. I've seen protests all over the city. Me yeah, too. Yeah. Every political event, like we went to see AOC in Irvine. There were um, free Iran signs yeah. yesterday at the Katie Porter GOTV staging site. There was a free Iran car. So, like, people are out. And I'm sure, like, it was a call and response kind of thing. Yeah. But, you know, whatever. Um, and then North Korea continues to just launch tons of missiles including what appeared to be a, a new sort of intercontinental ballistic missile. Those are the ones that can go really far. So not a lot of good news today, Ben. Yeah. Um, it's kind of rough out there, huh? It's kind um, of rough out there. That's why we had the, this kind of Brazil interview because that's like a bright spot. But even there, there's like crazy people doing roadblocks and, you know, 
Um, what's good out there? Uh, uh, I just gotta, the Jets beat the Bills. So you, you know, um, how did you? Yeah. yeah, you guys look like pretty yeah, good. The Knicks won last night. Like if any, like sports has gone pretty well. Yeah, you got a great uh, yeah. defense. You got a good we got everything corner. but a quarterback. You know. Yeah. Well. Yeah. We'll see. Uh, yeah, Favre just texted. These exits are brutal. All right, uh, well, White Lotus uh, episode two. Oh, I haven't watched it. Very yet. good. Very Spoiler. good. Yeah. Spoiler. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Uh, all right, we're gonna take a quick break. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We come back. You will hear Ben being much more hopeful, talking about Brazil, a yes. country where the good guy just the won good a big election. Won. Yeah. So stick around for that. We are so pleased to be joined by Tabata Amaral. You've been on Missing America, another one of my podcasts, but it's great to have you on Pod Save the World, Tabata. Tabata is a Brazilian politician. She's been an education activist. She is currently a federal deputy for the Brazilian Socialist Party, representing the state of Sao Paulo. Tabata, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you, Ben. It's an honor to be here with you one more time. And very important, uh, hectic moment for my country and yours. So I hope this can be a good conversation. That's right. Well, let's start there. Um, so uh, Lula uh, recently uh, won a very close election there. Um, you supported his campaign, uh, even though you're not traditionally totally aligned with all of his politics. I just want to start with the election itself. Um, there were a lot of fears and concerns that uh, outgoing President Bolsonaro might reject the results. He himself uh, said he might <laughs> reject the results. Um, it seems like the transition is moving forward, though. Um, what is your update on just what is happening in Brazil? Are you confident that um, there will be a peaceful transition of power to Lula, uh, or are you concerned about efforts from Bolsonaro and his supporters to uh, disrupt the transition of power? Yes, it was a very close uh, election. What was very scary to me, uh, when we speak about Bolsonaro, we are talking about a president that uh, denied the, the buying of vaccines for a month and a half, who, according to many scientists, is responsible for uh, hundreds of thousands of deaths who could be avoided during the pandemic. We are talking about a president that um, is uh, pro-deforestation, who put our country in a very, um, in a position that made me ashamed uh, when we talk about the international scenario. We are talking about a president uh, who is responsible for basic education, walking back for the first time in our recent history. We worsened our scores in math and Portuguese during his mandate. Uh, we saw hunger um, increasing. We are talking about someone who promised during the campaign that if he was elected, he would interfere in the judiciary. He would uh, make uh, the Supreme Court bigger so he could have more appointees than he should. So in summary, we are talking about someone who um, promised to follow Chavez's steps. What he wanted to do with the, judici the judiciary is exactly what Chavez did in Venezuela. We are talking about someone who made my country suffer a lot and yet, he got almost half of the valid votes, which is extremely scary to me. And it, speak, it speaks about how divided my country is. It's also important to say, though, that there was a lot of corruption in his mandate and that uh, he created something called the secret budget, which basically uh, gave his supporters access to hundreds uh, of millions of reais per year to do campaign. So it's not only about ideology. Uh, Bolsonaro managed to uh, use public money to fund his campaign, to fund his efforts. Uh, so those two comments about uh, the, the election. And even though uh, we were successful in creating a very broad coalition, I think this is the broadest coalition Brazil has ever seen in our history. We are speaking about from the left to the center right, uh, all the Democrats were, were there together. So it was really hard. And what scares me is that uh, we, our country is divided. Uh, we did everything we could and the election was still very close. I'm proud of the broad coalition we were able to build. I'm glad uh, the, the hardest par part has passed, but I am concerned with the moment of my country. I am concerned when I see so many people uh, on road, roadblocks as they are now, asking for military intervention. I am scared when I see that Bolsonaro was able to elect very 
extreme extremist people to the Senate and the Chamber of Deputies. And I'm scared to think that even though uh, he was for sure the worst, worst president we have had in 30 years, he almost he got almost half of the votes. So I don't know if I, I am clear, but I'm glad um, we won. But I am so concerned and I am so on the alert and trying to learn with everything that happened and try to understand how we will be able to reunite and rebuild this country that I'm not allowing myself to to rest. That makes sense. And it sounds very familiar um, because we've dealt with the exact same situation in the United States. Um, I'm going to play you one um, one clip from uh, one of President Trump's supporters here in the United States uh, about the Brazilian election. Remember, we were watching the Brazil election. Our cyber guys were watching and uh, they took that we know that we know of was 5.1 million votes and uh, th through the machines. When I say pure machine, there's no paper. It's just a tap, boom, 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 boom. So whatever that tells you, whatever programs inside, here's who won. That is a guy named Mike Lindell, who uh, made a fortune selling pillows in this country. And he was one of the big supporters of President Trump's efforts to overturn the election here. The question I want to ask you about that clip is you hear him talking about conspiracy theories of votes being stolen from President Bolsonaro. We've seen President Trump endorse uh, Bolsonaro. Um, we've seen Trump advisors uh, go down and meet with Bolsonaro. W what is your view of this connection between Trump and Bolsonaro? Are you aware of these Americans who are spreading these conspiracy theories? Is that a problem down there? Or is it is it just part of the strange reality that, uh, that we're living with in American and Brazilian politics? I do think it's important to laugh when we have the opportunity. And I just want to give back uh, another conspiracy theories, uh, theory that involves Lady Gaga. I don't know if you know that. Did you hear about it? I saw this. I saw some picture of Bolsonaro talking to somebody that they said was at The Hague, um, but it was actually Lady Gaga. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So uh, there is this huge conspiracy theory going on on social media in Brazil that Lady Gaga is a judge and that she intervened in the Brazilian election. And I say that because, well, I, I don't have the answers. Maybe you can help me here. But uh, I think we are some somehow broken as a society it is funny and i try to laugh to laugh of it otherwise we go crazy with all that is happening but uh for some reason there is this thing going on the whole globe and i have some explanations maybe that make it easier for some people to believe that lady gaga will intervene in the brazilian election uh, than just to accept that their candidate lost an election. Yeah, and, and I don't know how to explain. I think it has to do with identity. It's a matter of, uh, and there are there are so many books about it, and I have read them. Oh, <laughs> Yasha Munk and uh, Levitsky. But one um, book that stuck to me was uh, Sandel's The Tyranny of Merity. Because I think somehow he he gives a way to us. Uh, there is there are a lot of people both in the U.S. and in Brazil, and maybe in that sense they can relate that feel they don't have a place anymore in society, that are doing worse than than their parents did, and who are receiving social media every single day statements about their failure, and things like as we have a, a phrase in in Brazil that goes like. Uh, if you didn't get it, you didn't try hard enough. And we know it's not true. There was the pandemic. There is uh, a change, uh, a technological change in, in the way the economy works. And all those people so suddenly, they, they feel like they don't belong anymore. Nobody understands them. And everyone is telling them that's their fault, that they, they're not succeeding. So I do have this feeling that both Bolsonaro and Trump share this thing that they go to those people and they tell that they they are worthy that they should be heard that they have value and that uh it's the system's fault that they are not doing well it's the immigration it's the communist uh the goals are many but i have 
I have this feeling that uh, today's election day was matters so much to us in Brazil. Everyone is commenting about it. And uh, what happens in Brazil is being watched uh, by Americans because we share this problem more than anything else. A whole part of society who feels that they are being left behind, that they don't belong anymore. And then come the, these populists uh, in the extreme right and give them an identity, give them something to fight for. We are making fun of those people who are right now in Brazil blocking the streets because sometimes they do things that are, are sort of stupid. But there are this is an organic movement and there are people who chose not to go to work but to fight for something. And I just say that because, well, clearly I don't have all the answers, but I have this feeling that maybe we can help each other more like in a global statement. Yeah, We have to do something about it. We have to do something about all the people who are being left behind by the technological revolution, all these people who feel they don't belong anymore, all the impacts of social media. And then we have to talk about uh, fake news and all of that. But I'll give back to you. I think you gave us a, a, a really good answer and, and a lot to think about. I, I want to ask you about education, actually, uh, because it's something that doesn't get, I think, talked about enough as a part of the answer to what's happening. Um, you, when I met you, I met you, I think, for the first time back in 2017, maybe, before you were elected, I think. And you were an education activist, and I know you focused on education and, and government. Um, and I also know that President Bolsonaro spent a lot of time trying to change the education system to push his own agenda, to push, you know, some some uh, evangelical Christian uh, viewpoints in the education system or to push kind of an anti LGBT agenda. Um, now that you have a new administration, hopefully, uh, that c comes into power uh, under Lula, how is education a part of the answer here? I mean, it seems like, you know, pe people believing crazy things like Lady Gaga intervening in the election, that th there's some connection <laughs> between um, education and economic opportunity, but also education and, and a healthier society. Wh what are the kind of changes that you would want to see on one of your key issues, education uh, under Lula? As I said before, uh, there is this evaluation that happens in Brazil every two years since 2005. And this is the first time since 2005 when we started to have the, to get these scores. When Brazil goes, goes worse than it had gone before. Just to say that uh, under Bolsonaro's government, uh, we worsed our scores in math, in Portuguese, dropout rates increased a lot. And it's important to say that because in Brazil, uh, an economist called Pai de Barros has shown that a student that doesn't finish high school in Brazil lives three to four years less, has more chances of uh, joining criminalities, uh, gangs, of having a, a, a disease and so on. So uh, if we don't act fast, we are talking about a whole generation that will have a much, uh, a much more unhappy life than they should, much less opportunities, and we have uh, many challenges to face. Uh, Bolsonaro has cut a lot the, the investment in education. Uh, many of the programs that were laid by different governments were destroyed. When we talk about uh, technical education, uh, a more holistic view uh, to, to our schools and so on. Uh, but also there is this cultural war that uh, Bolsonaro um, fought that uh, had a, a consequence that would take us more time to deal with. So that there is this, and I think that happens in the US as well, uh, this whole movement to impede teachers of talking about racism, uh, LG, LGBT pho phobia, uh, gender issues, so we are in a moment in which teachers are very scared uh, to talk about those things, because if they raise uh, an issue related to human rights, um, a parent or uh, uh, someone who, who uh, hire them might just come and say, OK, you can no longer teach here because you are a communist, because you have those views. So just to say that, uh, yes, I work very hard to make sure that the 
the resources and the investment um, are at least to the level they were before uh, Bolsonaro. I work very hard for technical education, which is very important to me to make sure that we look at uh, mental health at schools. Here in my state of Sao Paulo, out of 10 students, uh, uh, seven have some symptoms of anxiety, depression, so on. So that there are many things uh, I, I'm hoping I can work with to make sure that uh, low-income students, uh, they have uh, income so they can stay school and so on. But uh, I, I, I'm not sure how we'll make sure uh, to go back to that stage in which uh, no one uh, is against teachers talking about human rights and teachers telling us that we should respect diversity, we should embrace diversity. So that will take uh, a little bit longer because yes, we have defeated Bolsonaro, but again, there is a, a huge part of the population who seems to align to that view. Yeah, no, it sounds very, again, very familiar to hear. Another issue that people around the world have watched very carefully is the deforestation in the Amazon, um, which is one of the most important um, parts of uh, fighting climate change, making sure that you don't lose um, uh, well, the Amazon in particular, but, but forests around the world. Um, what what can be done to to stop that that deforestation? Are, are you optimistic that with Lula's election, the the rapid deforestation of the Amazon will stop? Uh, that that illegal logging will stop? Um, w- how should people around the world look at the Amazon issue going forward under Lula? I was just participating in an act here in Congress, in which I said that it might take longer to us to rebuild what was destroyed. Then it took them to, to destroy everything. We are talking about uh, many institutes that the, uh, were created in Brazil. To It's a network of protection of the forest who was just destroyed. We are talking about uh, civil servants who are persecuted by doing their work, uh, all the cuts in budgets that happened, uh, deforestation rates that increased a lot, but we are also talking about a region when we talk about the Amazon that became very violent. Uh, in, in Brazil as a whole, we saw the homicide rates go down, but in the Amazon, the opposite happened. The circulation of uh, firearms increased a lot. Uh, we recently saw uh, the death of uh, Don and Bruno, I'm sure you followed, who were killed by, by those criminals. So yes, I am optimistic that uh, this new government will understand how crucial uh, the, the environment is, uh, including to our economic development. There are uh, many projects that I have presented myself who I'm uh, looking forward to, to fight for, but uh, I think it won't be so easy because um, there is this expression uh, in, in Brazil that goes like a place of no rule of law. Yeah. And that's what the Amazon has become. Uh, when we talk about even um, international networks of narco-traffic, uh, there, are, there are a lot of people who are uh, making profit out of everything that Bolsonaro did during his term. And uh, things have become even more messed up and mixture when we talk about criminality, deforestation, uh, all the hate against indigenous people. So yes, I'm confident of the fight. We'll be there to, to fight this fight, but uh, it, it won't be any as easy. One thing that makes me uh, so sure that by the end it will be successful is that, uh, again, I think people are starting to understand in Brazil that we only uh, we only profit by protecting our forests. We are in a position in, in the world stage in which we can uh, we'll be more developed. We'll be more just if we invest in our environment. It just won't be easy. But uh, and again, as I uh, a young representative, uh, I'm still 28 years old. Uh, I'm also very confident that this new generation will have a different look on, on the climate agenda, for instance. One of the projects that I, I care about the most is make sure that uh, different municipalities in Brazil have adaptation plans for climate change. And I have this feeling that whenever I'm talking to a younger audience, I don't have to explain much. So I also feel that this will help us looking forward. 
so much of this conversation um, sounds familiar, right? Uh, in that the U.S. has dealt with an, an autocratic president uh, who maintained an alarming amount of support. We have the same culture wars happening in our schools. We have the same climate change deniers um, that we're dealing with. Um, and we have an election today. Uh, this this will come out tomorrow. We'll know the results. Um, um, you know, likely it'll it'll, it'll be. Um, you know, the Democrats are, are, are probably going to lose some some ground in, in our Congress. Um, but I just want to step back, though. Uh, what did you learn in your election um, about how to build that big coalition from the center right to the left? Um, are there lessons? Because I, I think we have to learn from each other. What, what works? What are we fighting against? Um, it's a big part of what we try to do on this podcast. Uh, and so... What 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 are what are the lessons you learned about what worked in building a coalition that wasn't as big as you'd like? You know, the election was closer than I think anybody would have liked, but you were able to win. Um, how do you build a coalition that includes people who disagree about things, but that agree about democracy? No easy job. Um, one thing that uh, was important, both in the national election, but also in a smaller level at my uh, re-election was to talk about the concrete stuff. Uh, and I have this general feeling that partisan politics has become very uh, intellectual <laughs> and very elitized. Uh, I don't know if I can say that. Yeah, elitist, but, yeah, elitist, yeah. Yeah, I have this feeling that uh, the more moderate center-left, center-right politicians and partisans, we have many in Brazil, different to the US, uh, they have started talking about things that might be viral on social media, but who, which don't really connect to what happened to people. And I have an example from my election. Um, in Brazil, uh, all the center was destroyed. We saw in Congress an election, uh, people who are much more to the right or more to the left. Those who are center left, center, center right, didn't have much chance. And I was able to increase my my uh, my number of votes in that scenario, and I would say that one of the biggest reason was because I during my mandate and my campaign I was talking about very concrete stuff. So one of the biggest fights I, I had in Congress was to make sure that public schools had pads, so poor girls wouldn't be wouldn't have to. Uh, miss classes where they were in the, their period. I thought so teachers would be vaccinated earlier so we could open schools. Uh, I fought for basic income um, programs. And I and I have this feeling that uh, this was important in my election and I, I chose to ignore social media. I, I have been canceled on social media many times in, in one week, but I was in the streets every single day during my mandate. And I was the only moderate to have such a, a big uh, uh, vote. And for me, moderation is a good word, even though it's not uh, uh, in a good moment uh, here in Brazil. And when we talk about the national elections, there was a huge effort in terms of uh, moderating and opening the dialogue. Uh, Brazil is changing. We have uh, an increase in the number of uh, people who are evangelicals. Uh, and those people have things to say. They want to be a part as well. And I have this feeling that uh, the left uh, was ignoring that. And you would hear all types of um, prejudice, such as, oh, I'm very scared that evangelicals will be the majority of my country. And I'm like, why are you scared? Like, go and talk to these people. Like, having Catholics as the majority didn't scare anyone before. And I'm Catholic myself. And I saw a real effort by President Lula and his coalition to open a dialogue with the evangelicals. Then I, uh, there is a lot of criticism on how uh, PT, the Workers' Party, conducted its economic policies. I'm one of the critics myself. And I saw many dialogues with people who have different economic views. And what are the common ground? Is there anything we can agree on? So this was not uh, easy. And this effort uh, was uh, much bigger between the first and the second round. And I think this was a mistake. I think this big conversation should have happened before. But it's hard. It's hard to 
uh, for atheists who have a, a good conversation with evangelicals. It's hard for people who have very left views on the economy have a co good conversation with uh, liberals. I think Bolsonaro somehow made it possible because he represented such a, a big threat to our country. But I think that's the way like a lot of different people have to sit together and say, okay, is there anything we can agree on? And one example is that President Lula wrote a letter to the evangelical community saying, okay, this is what my government will look like. And that's what we can agree on. Tabata, I think that's really, really good advice and really well said. Um, and uh, really appreciate you, you joining us at such an important time for both of our countries. Um, you're, you're doing great work, and I think there's a lot that people can learn from you. I hope, I hope President Lula continues to, to listen to you. You represent generational change there uh, and the kind of politics of getting things done. So thank you so much for joining us um, and look forward to keeping in touch. Thank you so much. Best of luck today. <laughs> yeah. And I also, I have this dream for my country that I extend to yours, that our Congress at some point look like our population with more Blacks, more women, more young people, because I think this is an important part of the solution. So again, I'm always here. Thank you so much. It was an honor and best of luck. I'm cheering for you. We're crossing fingers. Thanks so much, Tabitha. Totally agree. Uh, uh, best of luck to you. Thanks again to Tabitha for joining the show. I got. Right, let's just start counting these dumb votes. I mean, the, I mentioned this to you guys earlier, but the the good thing about being on the West Coast is, you know, a little earlier. Mm -hmm. You know, you start drinking, you can go to bed yep. a little earlier than you know. I, I don't know how people exist on East Coast time, for any live event, for sports. Well, it's just because we're getting old, right? So it's like, I just, uh, I like oh, it's so nice. I can. But even like Monday night football, like, oh, yeah, I can't stay up that late. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't want to watch this. I don't uh, want to watch are, it. Are you guys live streaming here or something? Or? We're doing like 15 minutes and then we're out of here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's uh, there's just it's gonna take a while, I think. It's a different vibe than 2018. The last <laughs> <term>. <laughs> just, I'm gonna say that. Well said. Yeah. Uh, okay. Well, we'll talk to you guys next week. Uh, probably have some more information about these elections. So, see you then. See ya.